Welcome everybody, uh, both uh, the audience here in the room with us and the audience on Zoom. That is, uh, as always with our events here that we've been doing on Zoom now for several months, uh, global, both uh, Israelis and Americans, Europeans, Australians, um, South Africans, uh, welcome wherever you are. Um, it's evening here in Jerusalem, um, it's, it's a different time zone in different parts of the world, of course. Um, but welcome anyway for this uh, opportunity to hear about a really, um, I think, um, groundbreaking new book, uh, at least new in English. Um, and um, it's uh, really, I think, um, a, a real boon for, for, for Jews around the world, not just here in Israel, but it is now available uh, for non-Hebrew readers. Um, my name is Paul Gross. I'm a senior fellow here at the Begin Center. Uh, for those of you who are regulars to our Zoom, you'll know me. Usually I'm in front of a screen and the, the camera's much closer to my face. Um, but it's nice to actually be here with real people um, in a room and hopefully we'll be doing more of these as things open up, uh, layout, layout, as they say. Um, so uh, what's going to happen is uh, after I leave the stage, um, I'm going to hand over to our moderator, David Fazzoni, um, and he will be uh, speaking to our guests, Professor Yossi Shine, um, and then there'll be time for questions at the end, both from the audience in the room. And for those of you on Zoom, you can write questions into the Q&A box in the Zoom, and we will try and get those questions asked as well. Uh, I just want to say, those of you in the room, there are books to buy afterwards. Uh, those of you on Zoom, um, we are going to be writing a link into the chat uh, of the Zoom for, uh, for you to purchase the book on Amazon. Okay, um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce um, Yossi Shane. Shane. Yossi Shane, my apologies. It's okay. Um, ah, okay, Yossi Shane. I've been saying Shane in all my, in all my conversations. You're not the this. only one. Okay, so Yossi Shane. So I think both in Hebrew and English, maybe the, 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 the pronunciation is confusing. Yossi Shane is a member of Knesset and one of the world's most prominent scholars in the field of diaspora studies. He was the chair of the School of Political Science, Government and International Relations at Tel Aviv University. He also serves as Emeritus Professor of International Relations at Georgetown University. Uh, I believe you've also spent time in, in my old country, the UK, um, uh, teaching there. Uh, he lives in Tel Aviv. And he will be speaking with David Chazoni, writer, editor, translator, the independent editor of Wicked Sun Books, and previously editor-in-chief of both Azure and The Tower. Uh, he has a PhD in Jewish philosophy from Hebrew University and is the author of The Ten Commandments, not the actual Ten Commandments. <laughs> <laughs> I assume. Um, but a book. But a book on the Ten Commandments. Without further ado, David Fazoni. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, do you. Does he need the mic for the Zoom? Uh, yeah. No, uh, maybe it's probably less. Thanks. Thank you so much, Paul, and uh, thank you to all of you who came this evening and to all of you who are visiting us on Zoom from around the world. Um, <laughs> this is a very exciting moment for me. Um, I've been aware of this book and very impressed with this book since it uh, hit the stand in Hebrew and uh, was very widely covered. Um, to me, uh, you'll see this is a a crucial moment. Um, but in order to help others in the audience understand that, uh, we, we have a few, few questions we need to cover. Uh, but before we do, I just want to say that there will be copies of the book sold afterwards. Um, and for those of you who uh, prefer to purchase through Amazon and live in Israel, it's part of the free shipping deal for over $49. You can get it uh, uh, in Israel. So just, just to let you know. Um, this book, uh, The Israeli Century, makes a very powerful claim about the time we live in and, and kind of a, a, a rereading of all of Jewish history to help us understand the time we live in. Um, but we need to dig deep a little bit to understand what that means. So, uh, Yossi, my first question to you is, what is the Israeli century. What do you mean by that? What is the, 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 the thesis of your book? Before, first of all, thank you so much for coming tonight. And for those of you who are on Zoom, uh, of course, I welcome you. 
before I uh, begin a bit with my comments and my discussion with David, I really want to uh, acknowledge uh, Mr. Elon Levy, who is here, just, just in the back. Elon is uh, in the seminar in, in translating this book and uh, impeccable job and I'm honored. And David himself was assigned to me as the editor for the English version. And because of him, I think the book was improved from the uh, Hebrew version and uh, was uh, more, more material was added, especially in the case of America, American Jewry. Um, so I'm very grateful uh, for your, both of your contributions. Um, the Israeli century was written as I started to write it out. I'll tell you maybe if you give me two minutes, I'll tell you how I came to do it. Um, it daunted on me a long time ago as I'm the scholar doing scholarship on diaspora politics all over the world, not only of Jews, that something is really happening which is quite remarkable. While in many countries in the world, people started to talk about diaspora as an expression of an extension of the nation state, something of a normal nature and borrowed from the Jewish experience, uh, all kind of mythologies and all kind of uh, symbolic gestures and institutions. The Jews have become more and more preoccupied and uh, dedicated to the idea of sovereignty. And that's something which was really interesting to me. Secondly, as I travel the world, for many, many years I've been traveling the world for my work, for my academic work. As David mentioned, I, I joined the Knesset only eight months ago, uh, and I've been in academia for almost four decades. Um, it became clear to me that when I travel through uh, Jewish communities in many, many places, there was a process which I call the Israelization of world Jewry. America is a different story perhaps, but if you travel to France, if you travel to England, if you travel to uh, Germany, anywhere you go, you see that the, the presence of Israel, whether you like Israel or you dislike Israel, doesn't matter, is a key factor in defining one's Jewish identity abroad. And at the same time, the communities were depleted, were not strong enough to have other identities that build their nature. This idea, and as I wrote chapters on this in the beginning of the 1990s and later on in the early 2000s and so on, I kind of accumulated a, a vision in my, in my soul, so to speak, that something is really happening. And this process has been accelerated tremendously in the last two decades, whereby the state of Israel has increased its population dramatically vis-a-vis -vis world Jewry. We're now comprised uh, over 46, 47%, doesn't matter already, but the trajectory is very clear that by in 10, 15 years, the vast majority will dwell in Israel. So first of all, this will be a nation that dwells in its own country. And secondly, there are not really viable diasporic models with content that I could see, not in France, not in Britain, not in America, that could really hold the line and really speak on a, a grown vision like it used to be in the 19th century Germany or in the Bund in, in, in the post, uh, in, in, the, uh, uh, in, in uh, the kind of like toward the end of the Russian empire or for that matter, the idea of autonomy uh, that was so pronounced also in the early part of the 20th century. These were all kind of like, Dissipated. I also had kind of very interesting experiences. And I started to ask people, who are your Jewish role models, for example? We talked about. So in America, the youngsters, which I taught at Georgetown and other places, could not say anyone. Or if they could say someone, they, was, they were kind of people of the past. Elie Wiesel was the last one I remember that was mentioned as a Jewish role model. After that, they didn't have any role models to speak about. And that kind of like also, it, it kind of like, it showed me that something very fundamental is happening. This was kind of um, in the back of my mind. So I started to dig into the subject and to see what really happened. In addition to the growing evolution of the state of Israel in all fields of life, 
and the, 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 the explosion of the population, you know, we are 3.19, whatever the 0.19 means, uh, uh, children per woman in Israel, no, no comparison to any other OECD country. Even in the last OECD report, which was published this week when the OECD came to Israel, I come now, I'm a politician now. So the, it was important for us to, to see what the OECD is saying about us to uh, my, uh, uh, my, the chairman of my party, uh, uh, Yvette Lieberman and so on. It was clear that this is a key factor. They spoke about this population explosion. They spoke about also with trepidation about what happened with uh, the Haredi community, with the Arab community, how it will be uh, arranged in the, in the future economy of Israel, regardless of this tremendous growth that we are now experiencing. So I decided also to start to dig into Jewish history and to see what happened to the Jews when sovereignty informs their life? What happened when sovereignty taking center stage? And this phenomena, of course, is relatively short-lived in Jewish history from what we know. And we don't know much about the first temple days, we know a lot about the second temple days, especially during the Maccabees. We have lots of documentation so we can extract from that. We know that the architect of Zionism built on that for the legacy of nationalism as a sort as a restoration of antiquity into modernity while debasing or even debunking the life of halachic life in the Galut. The Galut was debunked. And, and I was trying to build a story, kind of take a story on the journey of the Jews from sovereignty to the loss of sovereignty to the regaining and loss again as, as a cycles, which I said can never repeat themselves. Why they can never? Because the mighty state of Israel, and it is a mighty state, I cannot see anymore this kind of like paradigm of exile and return, Galut, Veshiva, as a possibilities even under the circumstances of such a mighty state that can really, if something, God forbid, happens, it will rattle the entire world. And that was for me, not a kind of an end of history thesis, but something which was really very, very important to understand. And then because Israel has grown so much and because we have become so, uh, 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 I would say influential in so many ways and productive in so many other ways and problematic in many other ways, I was trying to see what this moment means, which I call the Israeli century, how it impacts Jews, how it impacts Jewry, how it reverberates throughout the world in the Christian world. One has to understand that for Christianity to have Jewish sovereignty was unimaginable. The loss of sovereignty informs everything that Christianity became. And when I traveled to see the Council of Bishops, just to tell you, and I met uh, Father McManus, and he told me the state of Israel and our recognition of the state of Israel is the most important development since the time of Luther. Nothing of that nature or travel to the Vatican to study that. Because for them to recognize the state of Israel is changing their entire theology. And also to understand the power of Israel. That's why, and this all happened since 1993. They were kind of reluctant as you very well know. And when the Pope visited Jerusalem, and came to Herzl's tomb. And I said, golly gee, this is really too much. This is a true recognition of sovereignty that, that absolutely overwhelms everything we knew about the, the journey of Catholicism as an outcome of Jewish history. So this was a big kind of journey that I started to take in many, many directions that I came to it. From my travel to, to uh, the diaspora communities, I was in, in France for two years and I was in England traveling back and forth. I have been all over the place and I've been in India and in Armenia, you just name it, just to see how this whole thesis developed. And I wanted it also to be a thesis for those who study diaspora, which became kind of like almost a buzzword <coughs> after the destruction of the Soviet Union, the big D, because everything was transnational, diaspora and so on. And here we are, the people who enrich the world with transnationalism and diaspora suddenly become sovereign, while others are kind of like uh, marveling on the Jewish model as a way of connecting between their nations and their kin abroad. Uh, no, too long answers. No, you should stop me. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. Um. So thank you. So 
I, I think that maybe we put ourselves in the place of a Jew in Tel Aviv, in Philadelphia, in Paris, around the world. You know, I grew up in the United States, as some of you can tell from my accent. Um, and my whole childhood, I heard the phrase 2,000 years. 2,000 years was the way the Jew related to, to not only his or her history, but, but who, who we are. We're people that was wandering in exile for 2,000 years. In, in your book, in the introduction, you make a very powerful and, and rather kind of unnerving claim, which is that 2,000 years is one version of Jewish identity. There's another version of Jewish identity, which uses the number 3,000. Yeah. Now, what's an extra 1,000 years between us, right? Um, but but, it turned, but you're, what you're suggesting is that these are diametrically opposed views that have a powerful impact, not just on sort of how we view history, but how each and every Jew around the world understands how they fit into sort of the ongoing human saga and the ongoing Jewish saga. So can you maybe explain what, what are the difference between the 2,000 year Judaism and the 3,000 year Judaism? The 2,000 year Judaism is, is, is the story we tell about the destruction of the second temple in 70 AD, which we don't want to get into debates in history, which brought us into calamity and kind of drove us out of the land. And the recovery of Zionism is the culmination of a huge journey from the destruction to the reconstruction, if you want. Uh, this is a story that basically uh, takes us into um, the drama of uh, the Jewish people uh, who could not sustain a, 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 a sovereign state, albeit they tried, and everybody knows Bar Kokhba's sort of experiment in 131 AD and, and 235 AD, which was a unique experiment. People forget. Bar Kokhba established a sovereign nation for four years, coined uh, 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 coins and, and, and was powerful enough almost to defeat the Romans altogether. Quite an amazing story. But this was the story. But if you take Jewish history, if you take the Tanakh seriously as the Zionists want to do, and if you take what happened ever since the Persian uh, 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 restoration of Ezra and Nehemiah, and if you take what happened after that in the land of Israel, if you take the Maccabee period, you see that everything surrounded the idea of the sovereign existence or the autonomous existence. And I made this clear. It was the biblical story. And later on, after the Babylonian exile, which was very short, was all about around the land of Israel. Albeit, diaspora was always present. They were always all over the Mediterranean. And you would be surprised how the Jews were known during the time of the Hellenic time as warriors, as people who were fighting wars for others. So for me, it was a much longer journey. Of course, there are debates how much we know about the sovereign period of the Jews in the first temple, how much we really can build aside from the biblical story. And this is, I don't want to get into Finkelstein and other sort of story, but, but this is interesting. We see, you know, we dig everywhere. And I was just in Marata um, uh, a week ago. When was that? Something like that. We, we travel the, uh, the, uh, the Chevron to uh, the Vaadata Chutz um, Vavitachon, the uh, Foreign Relations and Security Committee of the of the Knesset, to see the arrangements there. Because apparently, I didn't know that every year 1.1, not during the Corona time, 1.1 visitors, million visitors are coming to Marata Machpelah, and people say, you know, this is the this is the place where it all started. This is where Abraham, you know. Uh, uh, built our nation, our people. We were, first of all, a people, a kin, before we were religion. And the, we, there was no religion yet. There was a kinship kind of like, was a, there was a God order, but we were people. And the people who define who we are more than anything else, the kinship ties. And until today, 
Being Jewish is mostly, in my opinion, is being a member of a community which is kinship oriented. Kinship oriented, not religiously oriented, even though in Israel it kind of like became intertwined and also in the diaspora. All of this, of course, occurred 3,000 years ago as the Jews started to build themselves. And they built themselves as a kingdom. And when the kingdom was split, it's like I was referring it as this North and South Korea was split, or North and South Vietnam, or, or East and West Germany was split. And the Assyrian taking over, it's only one part of the story. We have restored. And so I talk about the exilic time. Why we exilic time? The seed of Israel is being superseded by the, by, by the holy seed. What happened? How this process takes place? How you restore it when you become more sovereign during the Maccabee period? How the Maccabees have kind of like started to regain power of the place of Israel, the land of Israel, and sovereignty over all the diaspora. What happened in Alexandria and other places? How Jerusalem became the key point, and the key point in terms of also leveling taxes, and 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 also uh, uh, we know during the, the Herod time what happened with, with when he brings. Uh, 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 rabbi, so to speak, coining, bringing, bringing them from the diaspora in order to sustain himself in power. And I wanted to see how this power relates to other powers, how this power is, is, is disseminated in terms of the legacy of the Jewish people around the world, what the people, other people during the Roman time think about the Jews. They think of them only as people of, of the land, only of, as people of <coughs> sovereignty. And all of this reverberated later on, not the story of the 2000 years. The 2000 years is a story that's supposed to bring the Torah and the preservation of the Torah and the preservation of the diaspora and the Torah as the legacy of the Jewish people, as opposed to the legacy of sacking the land, working in a sovereign state and becoming a powerful engine among nations. So this is the story. Thank you. So. So maybe to put it bluntly, we could say that a Jew or anyone studying Jewish history, you can't really understand the 2,000 years unless you understand the 1,000 years that came before it. Yes. And you can't even understand the last 70 years since the founding of the State of Israel without understanding the full 3,000 years of history. That's sort of the, the central claim of your book. And, and that when you look at what Israel is becoming, both objectively as a prosperous and powerful country, and subjectively as a centerpiece, one of the most interesting things you write is that, is that even where there are places of, of really fruitful Jewish diaspora creativity, you focused on literature, which I thought was fascinating, that you know, all you, you point out that. In American Jewish literature, there was a period of Saul Bellow and, and Philip Roth and uh, Isaac Pasheva Singer, where the focus was about the Jewish experience that had been inherited from Europe into American life. And then you said, now let's take a look at today's American Jewish literature. You mentioned Jonathan Seth and Foer and Nicole Krauss and a number of others. And you say, look, they can't write that way. They are writing even if they're, they're uncomfortable with Israel, they're writing in, with respect to Israel. They, they have to dialogue with, they can't ignore it. Mm -hmm. So what, what you're pointing to is, is what you call the Israelization. Yes, it's very clear you, you know, in, in Europe, in you know, the other diasporas, it, it, you can't miss it. But even within American Jewry, and, and you know, I, I see it very, very clearly mm -hmm. that uh, you quote uh, Rabbi Cosgrove yes. uh, um, uh, from, uh, uh, from New York City, from Manhattan, uh, Rabbi Elliot Cosgrove, who's a friend, saying, we used to argue about theology, we American Jews, all our denominations about who wrote the, the, the Torah and how to read the Torah. Now our main focus of argument is surrounds Israel. Um, but I want to ask you something else. Uh, maybe if you could, you told the story about how you came to write the book, but if you could take a step back, because I, I have a feeling, we're going, to, we're going to talk in a minute about what you're doing in the Knesset, but I have a feeling that, that, that we're going to be seeing a lot of you soon, um, uh, or uh, we 
in Israel and around the world. Uh, maybe if you could take a step back and tell us a little bit about your, you know, where you came from, what your story is that led you to this kind of a line of thought. How did you get so interested and fascinated in the Jewish world and the Jewish story? Um, when I went to study, when I, when I traveled to study uh, many, many decades ago to do my PhD at Yale, the only thing I wanted to do is to move away from Israel. Not to move away with anger, but not to work on in Israel, to work on something else. But I could not, I could not escape it almost. I came as an Israeli, I grew up in Israel, I grew up to Zionist parents who fought in the War of Independence. All, the, the, all my childhood was informed, like anyone who grew up in Israel in the 50s and the 60s, by the recreation of Jewish sovereignty. I found many of the books I quote in my father's library. I want to take them in Hebrew. The book uh, 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 that Ben Gurion gave my father when my father finished Kusk Sinim in 1951. This was for me something that I kind of like, this was, this was, these were the days, I remember them, everybody remember them. But when I traveled abroad and I discovered in many ways, I started to go to synagogues only when I was abroad. Mm. I had to teach Sunday school. I was married to an American wife at the time who told me that I'm fulfilling her dream. I said, what's your dream? She said, I always dreamt to dump someone else in Sunday school. <laughs> when she took me on Sundays to teach Sunday schools to make a living. So this was her, her dream as a Jewish uh, uh, girl, to dump someone else in Sunday school. So I, I uh, but when I started to work, to write my, my PhD, I, I, I was fascinated by the work of political exiles. How exiles transform the world. Politics of exile became my subject. How exiles, as an opposition from abroad, are redrawing the boundaries of loyalties. That was my the, the number. The, the, my first book was the frontiers of loyalties. What does it mean to be loyalists from abroad? The Spanish Republicans and and Lenin and and even Khomeini. Anywhere you want. I, I went through history and wanted to to build a theory of how exiles are reconfiguring the idea of patriotism while being abroad. How the delineation of boundaries are basically defining what is, what is loyal or what is disloyal in, in, this, in this manner. And I moved away from, I looked at our history, but I didn't want to dig into it. But I, I could never escape it. I could never escape it. In fact, I became a scholar of Jewish life only as I was in America, because I had to take my kids to shul image. And I had to kind of like become, I could see that to, to retain an Israeli identity abroad which was so critical for me, was very difficult. I married to an American girl, a, a woman, a PhD student at Yale herself. I was like becoming very much uh, intertwined with American culture. And I could see how thin it was for me, the idea of American Judaism as I, as I experienced, because I was not religious. So this was kind of like a journey I went through. So eventually, Eventually, I came back. I had the guts of starting to deal after writing many books. I wrote a book called Marketing the American Creed Abroad at one point in time, which dealt with how others are relating to the mother country when they are in America. Many, many I was studying. I was in Mexico and Armenia, you name it, I, I, Indian Americans, etc. And kinship in international affairs. I, but I wanted kind of like to put myself away from the, not to be Israeli yet. Eventually, it hit me that this is what I was doing all my life. So when I was working, for example, on the Babylonian experience of the Jews, I took all my writings and all my understanding of how exile politic works in countries, uh, in many other countries, and basically brought the experience of today to the life, to the life of 2,500 years ago, and trying to superimpose my theories on and, and, and surprisingly, it worked very nicely. How to retain leadership while abroad, how to retain community, how to retain ethnicity away from sovereignty, how religion come to supersede that. And for example, if you look at the Indian community abroad, I don't know if much you know, the Indian community abroad invested and invented the Hindutva. The religious component of Hinduism was strengthened abroad by the Indians in America and was gradually been disseminated into India 
to impact to impact the Janata party and what Modi is doing today. Modi has adopted the diaspora as a model, the Jewish model, as a way of recreating Indian identity with religiosity because Nehru and Gandhi adopted secular nationalism. This was fascinating for me. So this is how I did it. With regard to American Jewry, as you said, it became clear to me as I was educating kids in America, they went to JDS, Jewish day schools, and so on and so forth. That something, it's not that we in Israel are having a model of Zionism, but certainly we don't have to explain much. We don't have to explain much as Israelis. You know, it comes natural. We speak the language and we are ignoramus because of our language, et cetera, et cetera. Many Israelis, they don't, have, they don't know much, but they, don't, they live the day-to-day -day life of, 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 of a national, national people uh, without even remembering their own heritage, with some degree of uh, masoret, of tradition. This is what many, many Israelis experience. In the diaspora, it's not enough. It's tough. Because when ethnicity is being depleted, when you cannot keep communities intact, you cannot keep, of course, religion intact, and you cannot keep kinship intact, and you have to remarry, uh, uh, intermarry with others. This is a, it's, it's an impossibility almost. It was possible when anti-Semitism was really at the height. And I speak, there is a huge chapter here what happened in Germany because many people don't know that Germany until 1870 only granted emancipation to the Jews. They could not escape it. But once the gates were open, they were rushing to assimilate in many ways. Nationalism is a totally different story. So for me, the American experience kind of taught me to see, and I looked at schools and others, how Israel is a very important component for Jewish organization, et cetera. Antisemitism was always a very important component, but antisemitism alone could not carry the day. Or, or after the Holocaust, it became more problematic to carry the day, even now, even now it's, it's returning. You have to keep communities intact. And who keep communities intact? The ultra-orthodox or the orthodox. Uh, uh, and, 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 but most of American Jewry could not go there. They were not there. They are not part of it. And when I travel, for example, six times I traveled to Los Angeles at one point to see what happened to the conservative movement. And I could see how their synagogues are being sold to the Iranian American in, because they were keeping ethnicity intact, Iranian Americans. They were marrying almost the in the Jews. family. The Jews. Jews, Iranian Jews, yes. Iranian Jewish Americans. They were much more kind of like tight as, as a community. It's not about religiosity. And so this is what kind of like prompted me to think about those issues. So, um, so look, I mean, as you can all tell, um, there, there's a tremendous breadth of research and knowledge that went into to putting together this book, The Israeli Century. Um, and I, I have to say personally, uh, something funny happened when this book was being funny for me as an editor. Um, I was thrilled. It, the person who uh, introduced me to this book was Elon Levy, who's here, the fantastic uh, translator uh, of of uh, this book from Hebrew. And now he's the spokes, the national spokesperson for the president of Israel, by the way. That's right. Um, and we hope, we in the literary world, hope this will not get you off track from the, 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 the truly important work you're doing as a translator. Um, I'm not kidding. Um, uh, but, but then I, I get a call. So we, we get the book and you know, I introduce to, uh, to the folks at Wicked Sun Press, which is a fairly new uh, imprint out of New York, um, uh, led by Adam Bellow, who is the son of Saul Bellow, who we talked about, and a really leading figure in New York publishing. And it's really a, a, a tremendous project that he uh, and, and David Bernstein in New York have undertaken. Um, and, you know, you sign a contract with an author, and you, you know, sort of shepherd the thing through the process, through the machinery of making the sausage of a book. Um, you get to a point where there's a, a final manuscript that's submitted and uh, uh, it's it's formally accepted by the publisher. And then you have a, you know, then it's really like machinery. There's all these steps that are very technical between receiving the manuscript and, and by the time the book actually is designed and printed and proofread and all that stuff. And some, at some point during that process, 
Um, Yossi calls me up and says, um, it looks like I'm, I'm going to be a member of Knesset. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, how did that happen? And I'm just thinking, I'm still okay. asking myself. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking, you know, okay, how did this affect his book tour, right? Like, I, I, how it affects the country, I, I have no idea. But how it affects the book tour, that worried me. Um, it shouldn't have, because once you enter the Knesset, you, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me that you, your Knesset activity, which is itself, far beyond what, uh, you know, in, in Congress they call it a freshman uh, congressman, a first year in parliament, far beyond what most people do their first year in the Knesset. Um, and you invited me to an event at the Knesset about a whole huge program that you're launching that to me sounds like it comes straight out of this book. Do you want to talk a little bit about what you're doing? I will say one thing, this is, uh, David is referring to the, uh, the lobby that I built and we hopefully will be able to really create something uh, of that nature of, of, of exporting Israeli culture among nations. And we brought really leading figures in all fields of, of creativity in Israel to the Knesset. It was really an emotional moment. But now it's the idea of translating it because you know, in the Knesset, as I learned very quickly, you have to be very careful to pronounce achievement before they are being uh, really uh, substantiated. Otherwise, you will be just Kalam Fadi, <laughs> member of Knesset. So I have to be careful. I want to say something else which we didn't talk about. You know, the book deals a lot with many subjects about the Israeli century, what happened now, and the, the big chapter on Israel, you know, like chapters on America, what happened there. But, one of the subjects that we discuss in the book, I discuss in the book, is the genealogy of what we call Jewish morality. How the whole idea of Jewish morality has been created. Uh, who created it from the time of the prophets and uh, you know, uh, exiles and return and all the way to the state of Israel. And of course, the, 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 uh, the thinking about Jewish morality in the Western world uh, from modernity on, from the time of Kant on all the way to Herman Cohen, etc., cetera. Um, and, and one of the things which was quite provocative, I said that Israel in many ways is killing Jewish morality as a conceptual understanding mm -hmm. because we are committed to raison d'etre. We're committed to statehood. When we have like a challenge on the border of Gaza, we will act and we will act to do anything to protect the state. This is our moral code. This is our calling. And that stands in sharp contrast sometimes to what people think that the Jewish morality should be in the diaspora. And I see this kind of conflict emerging also at the second temple time. At, 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 and, and you see all kinds of, and, and this is a huge discussion that I take through history. It took me only six months to write that, to think about that kind of like how, what happened here on Jewish morality? With regard to my, 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 my Knesset activity, first of all, uh, I have here, my team from the Knesset. The Knesset, first of all, requires from you to focus, to do things uh, that you um, think you are good at. At the same time, as I learn more and more, uh, you can become very uh, an unknown person in many ways in the Knesset, because no one knows what you do in the Committee for Security and Intelligence Committee. You, don't, you, don't, you cannot talk about it. Um, you are not the person to be interviewed because they like commentators to come and talk about it. They used to, they used to like me before in television more than they do like me now. You have to constantly be embroiled in how the media perceives you and what the media will do because the media will also generate what the decision makers will do and will put money on because they will think it is important. And this I need still to comprehend fully and, and become more effective in what I'm doing. To tell you that I'm effective, it will become an exaggeration. Sometimes I'm effective. Sometimes people listen. Sometimes people listen to the community on education. Sometimes people listen to the community on higher education of which I'm now chairing the subcommittee. But to be an effective member of Knesset, a legislator, I haven't been yet, a real legislator, I don't have kind of an agenda. I came to do things which I thought I can contribute to. 
I came with the attitude, it's not about me. I will leave the academia now. Okay, after so many decades, let's do something meaningful. When Yvette Lieberman told me, come in 2015, he invited me to come as I was advising him behind the scene as a foreign minister. Now I said, okay, why not? To tell you that it's easy for me, it's not easy for me. I'm not complaining about it, but I still have to find a focus because as a member of Knesset, you are not a policymaker and you cannot remain a philosopher, <laughs> certainly. You can have speeches, uh, you know, in Israel, whose, whose speeches are really important, not speeches that I will make, other speeches. Our yelling will be much more effective in today's life because of the media. So it is, it's, it's a huge challenge, I must tell you. So I'm, I'm, I'm charting my way and, you know, breathing very deeply uh, every morning as I come to the office, trying to see how I do something very good or not, but yet to be seen. The jury is not out yet in this business. <laughs> okay, one, one final question for me and then we can open it up. Um, 50 years into the future, the state of Israel, how do you see the Israeli century playing out over the next decades, in, both in Jewish history and in world history? I think that um, Israel will continue to be a very important state. I think it will grow to be uh, a mid-sized state. I think it has tremendous amount of creativity. I make a point that I'll tell you, for example, there was another theory which we didn't talk about. A very, a very important book was published in 2004 in America called The Jewish Century by a guy named Seleski and got a tremendous amount of uh, recognition. And I kind of debated him and I said, Slaskin had the idea that there were three moments in Jewish history in the 20th century. One is the Russian model of Jewry in the Soviet Union, there is the American, and the third is Israel. And he predicted the American Jewry will be the star of Jewish life into the future because America provided the Jews something that no one else provided. It gave them security, it allowed them to remain an ethnic group. And it also, in many ways, it, it, it allowed them to have a voice in international affairs as they did on the issue of Soviet Jewry, on the issue of the end of the Cold War, many other things. It really empowered them. They were powerful enough without, that's why this was really the golden Medina. And I think that this, this posture has also passed now. It will be, it will kind of like, will be a completely different story for American Jews. Uh, so, in, while 50 years from now in Israel, there will be a growing struggle, which is we are in the midst of a huge struggle between the Haredization of this place versus the modernization of this place. This is the big struggle that we are now basically living through. According to the OECD this week, in, two, in 2050, there will be, according to the numbers, but we don't know what will happen, 25% of Israeli Jews will be Haredi. And from that, for them, as I speak in the, uh, in, in the chamber, in the, in the, uh, the Knesset, only two weeks ago, uh, Mr. Eichler or Mr. Um, Litzman will go on the podium, or Gaffney will go on the podium and say, if you recruit us to the army, we will leave the country. And I said, this is quite an interesting mode of saying we are part of the right wing in Israel. <laughs> this is a very interesting idea. But you know, Yamin Male Male. What's Yamin Male Male? The Haredi who are leaving the country if only if they will serve in the army. Because studying the Torah is much more important than serving the army. So this is a huge struggle. 30% of Israeli kids, and this is what I do in Badat Achinuch, in the Committee on Education, 30% of first graders Jewish kids are Haredis now. What will happen? Will they be able to join us at what we call sort of like this modern advanced state that will have tradition, that will have, of course, nationalism, that will have modernity, or will we run into an extreme kind of explosion? I think this is something I don't know yet. This is something yet to be seen. Uh, I'm optimistic by nature. Some people call me hopelessly optimistic, but I don't see any way that this state will crumble. I think we are very uh, determined to keep it. Israelis are happy and understand that we have a, a good bargain here. The state of Israel is a huge success in many ways. You see now people will come more, but there will be huge struggles here. And these struggles can take us into bad directions. How bad they will be, 
what kind of explosions we will have. I'm less concerned about our external enemies. And I'm less concerned about our Arab enemies from within. I see now even in the coalition. The fact that 54% of Arab Israelis say, and this is according to the Institute for Democracy here in Jerusalem, year after year, that they are proud of being Israelis. This is not only that they're happy to be here, proud, and say, what does it mean to be proud? Alexander Jakobson constantly write about it. Uh, this is something very important. So I'm optimistic, but I think this, the journey is not by any means uh, a clear journey into the future. So uh, first of all, thank you thank so you. much, uh, Member of Knesset, Professor Yossi Shane. Um, you are talking about the Israeli century, a phenomenal new book uh, that came out uh, um, through Wicked Sun Press. Um, I want to remind those of you here that we'll be selling uh, and signing copies of the book uh, right after this event. And those of you on Zoom, uh, that uh, you should have the link to Amazon right there, uh, pinned in the chat. Um, and uh, those of you who are here, but want the Amazon link, I, I printed a nice big fat QR code on the table there. So, so you can just take, point your phone at it. Um, uh, we're not gonna open it up to, uh, to questions. Maybe we should alternate in-house versus, uh, versus Zoom. So let's start with somebody here. Just say your name before you. Uh, my name is Evan Bidol, uh, and I have a question regarding some of the concept of identity, national identity that you were describing. Uh, I wrote it down, so I'd make sure I got it right. Okay. Uh, Ralph Shlomo Boren talked about the idea of conversion. Well, maybe, maybe just, uh, yeah, for the, yeah, sure, just so you can hear me well. Yeah. Um, Ralph Shlomo Boren talks about conversion to Judaism as joining the people uh, and less of a religious experience. And uh, that agrees a lot with your idea that the concept of peoplehood is more important than some religious concept. Uh, we, while we've had great literary figures in Kutza, uh, the modern state represents the first time we've had sovereignty for 2,000 years, as you've mentioned. Uh, in what way does the legacy of the Sanhedrin and al not as religion, but as legal precedent, play a role in our modern state, especially in terms of continuity? And I, I bring this up because we have two great examples. We have this young woman named Miriam uh, Anzobin, I hope I'm saying her name correctly, who is an atheist who studies Daf Yomi and does it on TikTok. Mm -hmm. And then we have the Chavidim, who if they studied the Torah fully, uh, they would know that they should be feel morally obligated to join the army uh, since they would be defending other Jewish lives. So in that sort of that confluence of these things, what do you see the role of our traditions and our alaha and the, uh, the intellectual tradition of the Jews playing a role in modernity? Look, there are, there are no, you know, the idea, one of the questions that I'm asking in the, in, the, in the book, not only in politics, but also in alaha, right. is who speaks on behalf of, sorry, one of the questions I'm asking in the book, not only in terms of politics, society, et cetera, and, and there were communities, and you know, uh, I'm talking about uh, the times, in the absence of sovereignty, how autonom autonomous communities survived and how they managed to create certain leadership. But one of the biggest questions, of course, of today in terms of Akha is who speaks on behalf of the Jews and with what authority? And this is a big issue because we don't have an official spokesperson, let alone in Israel now we see the new elections through the chief rabbis. They are not. There are figures that are becoming more and more kind of like important uh, and, and for, for larger communities. One of the larger community, the most influential perhaps, uh, Professor Fertziger in, 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 in his review of my book said that I avoid, for example, the power of Chabad and the Rebbe, what he envisioned as the Jewish kinship ties that are completely, uh, uh, I wouldn't say not related to sovereignty, but sovereignty is a minor issue for Chabad. And this is still a very powerful uh, example of that. Uh, yet others, of course, can remind you of Soloveitchik's ideas uh, that, you know, like that, that saw it kind of as essay on Kordo di Dofek. It's kind of like looking at that as Pa'amea Geula or Rabbi Cook and so on. Um, and yet others will bring you other interpretations of halakha regarding service in the army, 
And uh, Lieberman always loved to, to quote from, uh, you know, like uh, from uh, Herzl and Jabotinsky and from, of course, from the Rambam in terms of labor, etc. The big issue is, of course, who is in command of these communities and how these communities really will get themselves involved. There is a process of Israelization of Haredi Jews. We see it. Asaf Malach writes about it. Others, there's so many data that I'm, I'm familiar with. Uh, but I think uh, there are also developments that run counter to the idea of sovereignty and the nation state and the army, etc. and what will happen. Um, all of this is part and parcel of what Judaism has evolved into in the diaspora with all kind of models that have existed, but mostly in the religious Jewry that existed in the diaspora and became so pronounced in the state of Israel. The fact that today the state of religiosity is defined also in the state of Israel. And I show it. If in the past, and you know, uh, Elon is here from England, River Mervis tells me that in the past, most rabbis in Britain were ordained in Britain. Today, all rabbis in Britain were ordained in Jerusalem. This is quite phenomenal. All of them. French jury, of course, completely impacted. And you see the, the halachic debates are being done here. And you cannot ignore the state, even if you want to. Even if you want to. So this is something that will continue to inform everything we do, with the exception, perhaps, of Chabad, which I'm not a scholar of Chabad. But it really, uh, uh, even in Ukraine today, when you speak about Ukraine and the, the, the network that Chabad built, built uh, is an important one. Uh, so this is, uh, I don't know if it answers the question, but it's a partial answer. If I could give a quick follow-up question. Yes. It should be hopefully brief. Uh, in what ways should uh, what we learn from things like the Talmud inform the way we interact with modern lawmaking in the Knesset? <laughs> Maybe that's not a short question. And it's not a question. <laughs> there is, I, I'll tell you, I write about a lot about Mishpat Ivri. Mm -hmm. and as, as, uh, uh, look, you know the debate in Israel about uh, the, the place of Mishpat Ivri in the Israeli law and the question of lacuna in the Israeli law. Uh, certainly we are, we are, we are, we are uh, should, should really keep it. We should try to borrow from it. We should try to uh, uh, bring it into how much, uh, how much the court is doing it. There were times that they did it, I think even more uh, and people knew it. I don't know how much now, you know, uh, the, um, it's all a matter of, It's all a matter of uh, how the court itself is being uh, built and who are the persons that are kind of like uh, becoming Supreme Court judges. Uh, so I don't want to say much more about it. Okay, a uh, question from the cloud. Okay, um, this is a question from Stephen Nadler in the United States who asks, is the, is the diaspora of the Jews a strength or a weakness? In your opinion, <laughs> this is you know either or. The diaspora is a natural component and part and parcel of the Jewish people. We don't have to explain it. Um, it's not a weakness. It's a huge strength for the Jewish people. The American diaspora and the world diaspora has been a key factor in the rebuilding of sovereignty and sustaining sovereignty and supporting it. But as I write in the book. In the old days, we used to talk about the, old, the rich uncle from America. Now it's the rich uncle from Tel Aviv. Something happened here. I remember my uncle coming from Brooklyn. He was a Holocaust survivor, giving me $20 bill as a kid. Here you go, Yossi. You know, $20, $20 today doesn't buy much. When I travel to America, I can give his kids now $20 and more. This is a totally different story, but the diaspora is still very important very important in terms of a political arm of Israel, in terms of understanding the Jewish life, in terms of interpreting Jewish history, in terms of putting the Holocaust on the table in a different fashion, in terms of, in terms of interacting with the Christian world, with other worlds. So that certainly the diaspora is very, very important, but it's less important vis-a-vis -vis the state. When the state of Israel was created, we were six 
600,000 Jews here, and about what left in the world, about 11 million in the world, and American Jewry was a mighty, mighty development. Mighty development. Now it's changing. And this change has to be taken into account. And everybody takes it into account. You, in the old days, you know, you spoke to Jewish organizations in a certain fashion. David Harris, my good friend, who is now retiring from American Jewish community, was kind of like the, for a while, the most important, perhaps, figure in, 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 in international. No longer. They are a side story. And the Jewish organization themselves, as I write about them, must have Israel in order to sustain themselves as organizations. Look what happened to Bnei Brit. Look what happened to American Jewish, the, the, the American Jewish Congress. Look what happened, look what happened to the reform movement, which I write a lot about. The reform movement, which saw nationalism as antithetical to Judaism, completely in the Pittsburgh Agreement, now embraces Zionism as the key factor of its own legacy. Otherwise, what is left? And I, and I talk about this idea of tikkun olam that everybody knows here that cannot carry the day. Because if my daughter is doing tikkun olam in Nicaragua, c'est la vie. So after that, what is happening to the kinship ties? So that's why Israel is so, so critical here. Call for, uh, uh, questions from the locals. If not, we'll go back to uh, to the Zoom folks. Okay, uh, Sweetberg asks, um, what do you think ought to be Israel's role in fighting anti-Semitism in the West, and how should it go about it? For many years, Israel didn't want to touch anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism served the legacy of Israel. And I'm blunt here, why it served? Because we told you so, if you only come here, you will be secure. There is no security in the diaspora. Diaspora is an aberration. Galut is the diaspora. It's not a normality of diaspora. It's an aberration. Albeit, when Blaustein contested this approach to Ben-Gurion in the early 50s, Ben-Gurion awarded the American jury a diasporic component. Kind of a diaspora. Uh, uh, Walter Eitan was in the Misrada Chutz. The foreign minister kind of enshrined that there is a difference between Galut of all the Jews abroad and the American Jewry, which is a diaspora loyal to its to American to the American state. Uh, so the idea of anti-Semitism was not dealt with uh, in Israel, even when Begin were here in the Begin Center, when Begin when when the AD when the ADL came to Begin, Foxman came to Begin. And the Foxman told me that personally and told him to take the issue of anti Semitism during the Camp David Accords with uh, uh, Sadat. Because in Egypt there were lots of movies anti Jewish, and, and Begin told him it will work itself out. It's state to state relations. Maybe it's not working for the first time with Sisi. I don't know, but I don't know how long before it will explode again. But the, 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 the the idea of the Israelis now in the Abraham Accord, look at it. We see C coming to embracing an Israeli <coughs> minister. Remember, you just saw that. Karin El Ara is sitting, sitting there in her wheelchair, and he walks the hall. And such a gesture and openness, and, 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 and the Bennett is there. This is something unimaginable. We didn't want to touch anti-Semitism in other countries. It became also the work of the diasporic organization. When we went to Durban, and Durban was an anti-Semitic, anti-Israel, anti-Semitic convention after the September 11 uh, uh, event. Remember that? Um, the diaspora minister in Israel at the time, what was his name? Ehud Barak uh, appointed him. Um, from a member of his father was the chief rabbi in Denmark. Oh, Michael Malkior. 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 I was I was invited to Barack's office. He wanted me to be the advisor. He wanted me to be the advisor on the Asper matters, and I saw the office. And at that day, on the 16th of August, 1999, I flew to Georgia. I said, "I'm taking the job at Georgia, much better than the, the, the government of Barack." Swear to God, this is how it was. This was how it was. I went to Jerusalem. I saw it. I said, Shalom. Bye. 
<laughs> and Malkior was the, I remember that Malkior wanted to be involved in, in Durban, but the, the, the diaspora told him, it's not your business. Anti-Semitism is our business. We do it much better than you. We Americans understand anti-Semitism. You Israelis don't understand anti-Semitism. And indeed, Israelis did not understand anti-Semitism. They were not sensitive enough to it. Even now, they're not sensitive enough to it. They kind of like, okay, uh, but 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 they could not understand the the, the Jewish existence in the diaspora uh, in terms of fear because they were they were almost looking down at those who are fearful because they should be mighty. We created a new version of a Jew who is not fearful, who is fighting. So why you are fearful, you know, like, uh, and you're being beaten in the streets of Germany. There were, of course, the Kahana movement, you know, Rabbi Kahana, who was trying kind of like to create the Jewish League. We are going to be, we, we are going, we're going to respond. And nowadays we see the repercussions of that, politically speaking, of Ben Vir and others here, who are still kind of like carrying the torch of the struggle abroad against anti-Semitism as if there is no state here. We have to do it because the state doesn't do the job. This is a legacy that we have to understand. I think we have time for uh, for one more question. Um, still nobody here, so let's go back to Zoom. Uh, okay, so a question from um, Gabe Brown in, uh, in Tel Aviv. Um, I can just find it here. Hi, Gabe. Uh, <laughs> a, friend, a, friend of, a friend of a few of us here. Um, Gabe, Gabe, wants to, uh, Gabe wants to ask a question about American, a little bit about American politics and whether you think and what you think is better for Israel with regard to the, the political divide in America, the, the Republicans or the Democrats? Do you want to get into that? This <laughs> um, maybe, maybe, maybe one way, maybe one way, if I can, if Gabe will permit me to hijack this question a little bit, is that it seems to me that there's, there's one of the big divides between American and Jewry and Israel, of course, was around that question, right? That Americans, American Jews were voting disproportionately for Democrats. Israelis disproportionately wanted Trump to win. Yes. Um, and that that question, I wonder if how that plays into the, the whole question of is, what's good for Israel? Is it different from what's good for Jews? I apologize again. I will, I will, I will, <laughs> put, it, I will put it in, in two different look. Undoubtedly, and there is no, there are those in America who consider Israel and its actions and its nationalist identity and the issues of the Palestinians. So, as almost antithetical to what they consider to be the legacy of American Jewry. And they are, you know, the Bayern arts, et cetera, they are kind of like fighting it. And we, and I, and I have a new chapter, which I wrote for this, in, 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 as, as in, in quotes from the currents, the Jewish currents that Bayern art is the editor. They even didn't like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who had some affinity to Israel, which was very minor in that respect. And these are vocal Jews, but they are less and less significant. Why less and less significant? Because they have difficulty in building communities. They may be significant among non-Jewish components of the liberal stream. And so this is something we have to deal with. At the same time, when Israel is becoming more and more identified, as we have become during the Netanyahu era, with a certain segment of the American right, perceiving sort of American hardcore nationalism, verging on anti-Semitism, and, and so on as their natural partners. We're doing something which will undercut many claims that we have here regarding our kinship ties, because we are undermining the, the, the ties with the diaspora. We are, with lots of things we are doing. I am a great believer that we have to be very careful. We cannot kind of like uh, pick and choose here in, in an aggressive fashion. We, certainly we should always accentuate that any American administration and any component of American Jewry should support Israel, first and foremost. And I'm all for it. Those who do not, we should be very harsh toward them. And all streams, including the ultra-Orthodox, uh, but there are many variations. This coalition, and I think this will, I will end up here because you read Thomas Friedman's sort of essay saying, I want to bring this coalition model to America. 
Cheney and Biden in the next election. You will. <laughs> Thomas Friedman always yeah. said dreams. <laughs> so uh, this is another dream. Uh, I, I, by the time by the time Mansour Abbas this week, uh, Nancy Pelosi was at the Knesset with a group of uh, six or seven uh, Congress people. And I was having lunch with Mansoor Abbas. And the only one they wanted to talk to was Mansoor Abbas. Yeah. And he told me, you know, in his voice, he said, well, see, all the time there are essays about me in the New York, the New York Times, I'm very important there. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed he's important. Indeed, because he represents very interesting aspect of the Israeli century. We hope that he continues like that. We never know. But um, uh, we have to look. That's why it also becomes very difficult for liberal Jews today to criticize Israel. Mm. Because Meretz is in, Mansour Abbas is in, mm. Reflect Avoda, the Labour Party. What do you want? <laughs> what, what do you want? Who do you want to go with? With the Meshutefet? You know, the Likud is part of the Meshutefet. So. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want you to break this right wing uh, opposition with the Meshutefet. So, uh, complex, but this is our life. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you Shane, uh, Professor Yossi Shane. Thank you so much, author of thank you. The Israeli Century, How the Zionist Revolution Changed History and Reinvented Judaism. Uh, I want to thank Paul and the staff at the so uh, Baby Heritage Center. It's been a wonderful evening. I'm David Hazoni, and uh, thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.